So without much ado, I'd like us to go into our presentation for the day. Uh, please welcome uh, Leah. Join me in welcoming Leah. Leah Brigante. Leah Brigante is a midwife with a decade of experience. She has been working in a series, series of roles, including clinical leadership, research, policy, and advisory. Leah joined the Royal College of Midwives in 2017, contributing to improvement of maternity policy and midwifery practices across the UK and internationally, working with the European Midwifery Association and the European Forum for Nursing and Midwifery, and representing ICM on WHO guidance development groups. In her development role as consultant, midwife in public health at Guys and St. Thomas NHS Foundation Trust in London, Leah led the Lambeth Early Action Partnership mid uh, maternity portfolio and developed an innovative social prescribing service for the prenatal period. Leah is part of the RCM Expert Clinical Advisory Group and has led a number of resources to support the pandemic response, including authoring the joint RCM-RCOG guidance on provision of midwifery-led settings during the pandemic. Leah has conducted research on midwife-led settings provision, the role of consultant midwives, and higher-risk women's experiences of midwifery continuity of care as co-investigator of the Popeye trial at King College London as part of her MSc in Implementation Science. And Leah holds an affiliate research contract with King's College London and is a guest researcher for MSc programs in global and public health at King's College London and CT University of London. Leah, over to you and welcome. So I'll give you presentation status, then we can continue from there. So welcome, Leah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carol. It's great to be here. And uh, I'm delighted to uh, start my IDM 2023 with you all. So for all of you that are midwives or aspiring midwives, uh, happy International Day uh, of the Midwife. So I'm going to uh, give you a bit of an overview of what I'm going to cover in this presentation. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, midwifery continuity of care models. Then we're going to move into the study uh, I did as part of my MSc. Uh, so we're going to be looking at the aims and the methodology that it was used. I hope that's not the most boring part of this presentation. And then we will move on to the findings, the conclusion and hopefully recommendation that people can take on from this study. So what we know uh, at the moment is that a lot of women and girls across the world don't have uh, the right uh, access to the right care when it comes to sexual and reproductive health as well as uh, newborn and maternal health. And uh, although there are uh, um, international goals to, to reach uh, um, universal cover, we know that it's very slow and uh, midwives have been identified as a solution uh, because midwives are in incredibly uh, cost effective um, and could meet uh, uh, the need of uh, um, women and girls and, and babies uh, um, by 90 percent. So we know that uh, we can use those publications like the um, World's the Midwifery Report in, in 2021 uh, to, to make a case for midwifery globally. So some of the data from that report, uh, they look at how midwifery could uh, affect uh, over 56 maternal and neonatal outcomes. And uh, um, those outcomes are improved by midwifery philosophy and practice, but also how almost 83% uh, uh, of all maternal deaths, stillbirth and also newborn deaths could be averted with high quality midwifery care. So I was very proud to co-author the position statement on midwifery-led continuity of care with Lise Lotte Quickel from the uh, Royal Dutch 
College of Midwives and also Sarah from the UNFPA. We submitted a statement to the ICM Council and it was approved and published uh, not very long ago. And the International Confederation of Midwives uh, as this statement that basically encourages all countries to advocate for the development of um, models of midwifery care, but also where those models don't exist to, um, to implement them, but where they exist to scale up and maintain such models and add an element of continuity. So what it is the continuity of care? Because there have been a lot of definition and uh, people seem to still be a bit confused of what he actually means. So we know midwifery on its own, so care provided in a midwifery uh, model by a midwife will improve outcomes for women and babies. But those outcomes are particularly improved when there is a non-midwife uh, caring for the woman and the baby across uh, um, the pregnancy, birth and postnatal, and postnatal period. So what continuity of care is, is care provided by a non-midwife and a small team to support as a backup, or often this is provided with a buddy or a partner midwife. And those midwives work in partnership with the women and they are able to lead uh, care provision and care planning for these women, as well as uh, providing and delivering care. Obviously those uh, um, midwives don't work on their own, they are part of a wider bigger uh, network of multidisciplinary team and they are able to refer uh, to specialists as necessary and make sure women receive the right care at the right time. And this, this data is based on the Cochrane review that Jane Sandal and, and the team led. So I'm not going to go into all of the uh, outcomes from the Cochrane review, but if you're not familiar with the Cochrane review, I would invite you to go and have a look because Every time I look at it as a midwife, I'm very proud that midwifery can make such a difference. So most of the outcomes that uh, have been shown to be affected in the Cognitive Review have to do with uh, um, baby loss. Um, so there, are, there is a, a reduction in gestational loss uh, by 19% before 24 weeks and 16% in general, women are 16% less likely to lose their baby. Mm -hmm. They also have a reduction in preterm birth by 24%. And there are some outcomes that apply to intervention during labor. So women are less likely to have an epidural or they're less likely to have an instrumental birth or an episiotomy. And they are uh, a, a little 5% more likely to have a spontaneous vaginal birth and no uh, difference in cesarean was identified by the review, nor differences in adverse outcomes. So what we know about uh, um, continuity is that it's a meaningful re relationship that is formed over a period of time, sometimes over location and over pregnancies, because some women are looked after by the same team and by the same midwife across even pregnancies. And there is an opportunity for the midwife and the woman to form a reciprocal relationship. This relationship often extends to the family because uh, women are often seen in their own homes and, and there is opportunity to involve siblings, partners and extended family. Obviously, this is a complex intervention because it's a model of care that has a number of uh, intervention offered within this model and we're going to go and look a little bit into the de details of those. So we don't really understand what the mechanism is. Possibly there is an opportunity to pick up when things go wrong much sooner because of the relationship and because knowing the person in front of us, but also it could be that uh, uh, the, the relationship is therapeutic and uh, allows also improved advocacy and improved uh, um, care planning and navigation of systems. So I'm just going to set up the context for uh, the poppy trial, which is the context in which my uh, study took place. So the poppy trial was a pilot study of midwifery practice in preterm birth, including women experiences. And it was uh, a trial 
uh, a feasibility trial. So it was looking at whether a model of continuity of midwifery care with access to a specialist obstetric clinic. So those are not uh, women that were low risk, those are, were women with, uh, with the mixed risk and increased uh, um, preterm birth risk. So women that were considered to have this increased risk would receive this model of care within an inner city UK teaching hospital. And um, ob obviously this uh, was looking at uh, uh, pregnancy outcomes and, and women experiences, but mostly looking at feasibility as it was in a feasibility trial. So a total of 334 participants were recruited in the trial. 169 were allocated to the POP intervention group, which is where my part of the study took place, and I will go into the details of that. And 165 received standard care. So women were identified uh, before 24 weeks, and they, if they had increased uh, risk of preterm birth, where they were randomized into the two trial uh, groups. So the women in the trial intervention group, they had um, antenatal intrapartum and, com and postnatal continuity from a primary midwife. And uh, they also were uh, referred to an obstetric or other consultation, uh, other specialist if needed, if they developed uh, complication during pregnancy and if they needed any additional care. Also, they received labor and birth care uh, in their chosen place of birth. So they had an option of giving birth in a hospital setting, in a midwifery unit setting or a home, always provided, uh, um, this care was always provided by the poppy midwives. And uh, um, they were also then seen by the primary midwife and the poppy team uh, at home following discharge from hospital or after a home birth. The care was received mostly by this named midwife that each woman was allocated at the start of, of, of her pregnancy, at the start of the journey. But every uh, named midwife also had a partner midwife. So each woman was given a, a primary and a partner. And also a small team of six was backing up 24 hour, 24 seven, providing 24 seven cover seven days a week so that obviously those midwives uh, could have some time off. And the team was composed by six full-time midwives, uh, including a team leader. And they were working very closely with the obstetric clinic, as again, um, those women allocated to the trial had some uh, level of complexities. And in order to maximize continuity and, and making sure that the women, uh, they were cared by the puppy team were also uh, familiar with the six midwives in the team. Uh, the team was providing antenatal education classes and also monthly group session where women could drop in and, and, and meet the rest of the team and the rest of the midwives. Um, I've put the uh, poppy protocol there if you if anyone is interested into going and looking at, into the detailed kind of intervention description. So the aim of my part of the study, the study which was set within the trial, but it was a, 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 sm a small study, was to look at the views and experience of women in the midwifery continuity of care intervention group and try to identify core aspects of continuity from the women perspective and possibly to use some of these uh, uh, findings on the core aspect to inf inform the development of continuity of care in this specific setting, but also more generally, because some of these could be transferable. So the methods I used were qualitative interviews. Those were semi-structured, in-depth interviews uh, after the, the women had uh, their baby, so in the early postnatal period. I had a topic guide, so I had a bit of a set of questions I wanted to ask, but it was more of a flowy conversation. All interviews happened in the women's home. They were audio recorded. They were then transcribed, anonymized, and uploaded on MVivo 12, which is just a software for uh, analysis. The sampling was uh, um, purposive. It was uh, the same criteria they applied to the trial uh, participation applied to my, uh, to my study. So obviously all the women I interviewed, they matched one or multiple risk factor for preterm birth. 
I ended up contacting 20 women and 16 uh, agreed to be in interviewed. And although um, there was uh, an attempt to seek variation in socioeconomic group, ethnicity, parity, and obstetric history, you will see my, my sample was diverse, but not super diverse. So the data analysis uh, was uh, um, using uh, Brown, and, Brown and Clark, the six stages described. So it was all about uh, familiarizing with the data, generating codes, then searching for teams, reviewing those teams, uh, and then uh, doing uh, all the writing up. Um, we, um, we were, I had a team, I had a supervisor because of my master and obviously uh, the wider uh, poppy trial co-investigators, some of them were, in, were involved with this part of the study, supporting me, so some of the interviews were double-coded and uh, uh, although the analysis was inductive, um, we then were kind of going back and making sure that the teams applied to the whole data set and they were not uh, very uh, dissonant teams. And the recruit recruitment kind of continued until uh, we achieved um, data that uh, they were satisfying, but also within uh, the project timeline because I didn't have a lot of time for this study. So in terms of participants, uh, most women uh, that were part of the study lived in a deprived uh, urban area, although uh, the household incomes was above the median average uh, UK income. Um, obviously we were in London, so London also has a slightly uh, different uh, median income compared to the UK uh, household. So in terms of demographic of the participants, I had, uh, um, you can see here, I had a, a good split in terms of age. Um, in terms of education, um, it was a, a well-educated group. Um, more than half were educated at degree level of higher degree le level. I had uh, the ethnicity split, uh, um, the, the European kind of included UK and uh, Eastern European or, you know, outside of the UK European. Uh, and then I had two women from Africa or Afro-Caribbean uh, ethnicity and one mixed and one Asian. Uh, so in terms of parity, uh, I had an equal split between uh, primiperos and neoliberos women and uh, I had one woman that had a previous preterm birth and four that had a previous miscarriage or loss before 24 weeks. So in terms of birth outcomes, uh, this was quite an interesting uh, sample because uh, um, a majority, uh, majority of the women planned to give birth in a midwifery-led settings, and this included the option available to them as alongside and home births. But uh, um, as you can see from the birth outcomes table, actually um, not, uh, not uh, all of them ended up in their favorite place of birth. And two participants experienced preterm birth, although their babies were uh, alive and healthy at the time of, of data collection. And uh, yeah, as you can see, we had uh, um, a, a split in uh, vaginal birth, 10 out of 16, um, and then uh, one elective cesarean and four emergency cesarean. So this is the most interesting part, and uh, uh, those are the teams that uh, emerge from the, the, the interviews, and I've linked that to the full paper if, if you're interested into, into reading about it. So those are the five teams, and now I'm going to go through each of them and give you some details and some quotes. So the first uh, team uh, was accessibility. So this was described as uh, um, women really enjoyed having this direct access to a named midwife and a team. This, this meant they had a mobile number they could call. This number was obviously a 24-7 number. They were split between uh, the, the team in terms of covering those 24-7 hours. But what it meant in practice is that women didn't have to call the hospital switchboard, introduce themselves, uh, give their data. They, they had a real responsiveness, but also somebody that knew uh, them was picking up the phone and they didn't need to repeat their medical or obstetric history. Uh, so one of the quotes here is this woman say, if I needed anything, she was there, I could text her, you know, I could speak to her, it was completely different. She was there all the time. This is where I actually took the title of my uh, 
paper because it was this idea of this woman had a baby before and she didn't have the kind of constant presence uh, uh, in the background of this midwife that she knew. The second team was time. Uh, and this might be um, a, a concept that uh, um, seems a bit odd, but often in very busy maternity services and midwifery clinic, women don't really have much time with their midwives and they come with a lot of questions, with a lot of things they would like answered, but they don't necessarily have the time and the space. And this was very different in the poppy team um, care because we, women said the midwives were extremely generous with their time. They, they never felt they were rushed. They never felt the midwife had somewhere else to go or something else to do. They just felt the midwife was there um, for as long as they needed it. The, the midwives were providing um, antenatal and postnatal home visits, and they also had uh, um, they also had a clinic, and uh, at providing uh, antenatal care, for example, in, in the women's home as well as postnatal, meant that often the partner or or older siblings could get involved uh, with the care, and uh, uh, that that kind of gave a, a, a different dimension of this appointment with the midwife. The, the third team was building relationship and uh, I, um, I found a beautiful description in the data of the women describing their midwives as uh, uh, being like a friend, being like a mother, being like a sister, you know, this kind of really emotional connection and, and, and relationship with the midwives. They also uh, spoke about knowing them and of them. So it wasn't just about, I know the name of the midwife. I, I really got to know the midwife. I really understand uh, um, uh, her as a person. And they received uh, social and emotional support. In fact, um, I think uh, the couple of women saying how it was then difficult to say goodbye at the end of the care. Uh, when you know they've been in this close relationship with this person for nine months plus, and then you know the, the discharge day arrived, and this person that they'd seen so regularly was kind of walking out. And uh, uh, again, uh, this this is a very nice quote of a woman that described them as friends with lots of skills. Advocacy uh, was uh, um, uh, another team that was uh, identified and kind of um, it was uh, it took place across three main stream. So there was the ad advocate uh, doing the advocacy for women autonomy, and uh, I will go into that with some of the stories. It also meant supporting free choice, including. Uh, women making the so-called uh, um, outside guidance uh, uh, choice. And also it meant navigating complex uh, uh, healthcare systems for the women and making sure that women were not lost or falling through the gaps. So those are two di very different stories, but I just wanted to go into, into them uh, given that we have time. And uh, so there was uh, the first one is the pink uh, uh, quote at the top. I'm not going to read it out, but this was a woman that uh, had uh, a very traumatic uh, first uh, experience with, with a forceps birth uh, and um, a, a long induction of labor. And she was told that she couldn't give birth in the midwifery led uh, unit this time because she had a complication. And the midwife, the poppy midwife, attended the appointment with a consultant obstetrician to make sure she had this personalized birth plan and she didn't need to go to the labor ward, you know, the obstetric unit, but she could go in a midwifery unit. And, and this is exactly what happened. She then ended up having a, a beautiful water birth. And I will pick up a quote from her later on in this presentation, which is, I think, one of the most powerful quotes I've got. And the, and the other quote here in, in the green, this is a different, uh, uh, you know, a different story. This is a woman that had an emergency cesarean, but she really wanted an elective cesarean this time. And she, you know, I don't know if you are aware, but there have been kind of uh, um, national drivers to reduce uh, unnecessary cesarean. So obviously she wasn't offered an elective cesarean. She was uh, encouraged to look at other option, uh, including a VBAC, heavy vaginal birth after cesarean. But for this woman, this really was not what she wanted. And the midwife, uh, 
the, the, the advocacy for her to make sure she had the elective cesarean. And this kind of removed all the anxiety that she had in the pregnancies and she felt very confident about it and about the midwives and the midwives really um, respecting her choices. Another theme was trust and trust obviously de developed uh, as uh, uh, alongside the relationship and women, you know, it was having the time, having the advocacy, all of those things then led to a relationship of trust. So women felt they could speak to their midwives, they felt respected, they, didn't, they did not feel scared and this improved disclosure especially in one case of, of a woman that had some social complexities and, you know, there was involvement of other uh, agencies and she was confident that the midwives would support her despite all the social complexities. This also enabled the midwives sometimes to take a, um, a role, a birth that was almost letting women do their things and just giving them uh, the confidence and this was described by a few of the women as this uh, feeling when their midwife walked in the room as they were in labor or they were in second stage that you know the mid midwife didn't do anything she just uh, walked in and sat next to them and, and just said hi I'm here and this kind of made uh, a big difference uh, for them and this quote at the top is exactly the quote I was saying earlier about this woman that had such a healing birth experience with the second time uh, because the midwife advocated for her to give birth in the military unit uh, and, and for, for her to use the pool. That she said, my, my view on birth was completely changed and now I'm able to pass a positive message about birth to friends and to my daughter, you know, this, this daughter that she had birthed um, six weeks, I think, before I interviewed her. The last theme was uh, um, that emerged from this present from from my study was the reduction of stress and anxiety, and uh, this uh, um, this is quite an interesting uh, theme because women felt they were in control of their whole process and knowing how the care was going to be organized and delivered and having been planning the care alongside the midwives meant there was no uncertainty and this applied to all sorts of things even things that i've never really thought about as a midwife myself having been providing continuity um, for years in, in my own uh, midwifery experience and it was things like being very clear of, you know, the midwife is coming to me, so I don't have to get into the car and drive in traffic, you know, I don't have to look for parking, I don't have to, you know, it, it was this kind of uh, being clear on what to expect, how how to expect it, when to ex expect it, uh, it was, it was a very interesting findings. And also, they had this kind of uh, uh, almost background presence of the midwives 24-7. This was a, a, a real big difference because they sometimes were not even calling the midwives out of hours. Sometimes they were emailing the midwives or texting the midwives, but they were not texting a hospital, you know, hoping someone would pick it up. They were texting this particular person and this person would get back to them with blood results, chasing appointments. So they felt they had this kind of, you know, they were in this bubble, they were being held. Someone was held in their pregnancy and their space. And this applied uh, to postnatal care. And uh, um, two of the, these women had preterm births and those babies were in NICU and, uh, uh, and, and the midwives did step in and, and support them even when they were discharged from the hospital and the babies were in NICU and, you know, really going the extra mile and making sure um, they were not being, um, they were not losing any kind of postnatal care because their babies were in hospital. And this is such a beautiful quote there as well. It, it was uh, uh, this, this woman say, as soon as midwife B arrived, uh, I stopped feeling fear and the body obviously relaxes. So in terms of, um, this is just to say that because the context of this trial was uh, uh, looking at the uh, feasibility of implementing such a model for women with obstetric complexities and with a higher risk of preterm birth. In the in the in my interviews, I was trying to look at, uh, you know, if there is anything that we could uh, identify that 
would have made a difference in terms of preterm birth. But you know, this is a very small study. There is no causation. Uh, there is some lit literature out there that if you are more calm and confident, and, and there is less stress and anxiety, and uh, and uh, this is provided by having a social support. This can buffer the, the mechanisms uh, to stress. But obviously, uh, and there is some some evidence out there that stress can be a predictor for preterm birth. But really. I can I can only say I can only conclude from this study that because they had continuity, they had uh, management and relational and information continuity. They had accessibility to the team. They were they described as you know those are the things that made us feel safe and in control. And obviously, because they were in a continuity model, they had very consistent care. They didn't miss appointments, they had very prompt referral, things were spot very quickly, and they had the, the, the referral that they needed. But there is no kind of uh, causation or, or association either, I don't think. So the, the key conclusion uh, I draw from the study um, is that uh, recognizing that if women are cared by non-midwives and those midwives are accessible all the time. These support women feeling listened to, but also to be actively involved in clinical decision making. And obviously this also then contributes to, to women feeling less stressed and anxious during pregnancy and birth, but also during the early parenthood. So I think it's very important when we look at implementation or development of midwifery continuity models of care for women with obstetric complexities, that we look at those themes and make sure that we have access in place. And when I mean, uh, when I say access, is this 24 seven access to have advocacy, to have time built in. So it doesn't matter if you see the, see, if you see the same midwife, but for 10 minutes, you know, it, it needs to be within a, a model of care that has all those core elements and those core components that will allow the relationship to flourish and to build. So then trust and advocacy and all those other things can develop from that relationship. Uh, so this is very important because it will improve outcomes, uh, it will improve women experience of care, but also it will uh, reduce uh, uh, anxiety levels. So those are um, all the co-investigators and, and, and the people that have been part of the puppy trial journey as well as the funders and I wanted to acknowledge them all. Um, my my co-investigator, but also the Royal College of Midwives that supported me to uh, to do my master, and uh, uh, King's College London, my my university, and the NHR that funded uh, the trial, and uh, obviously um, a, a very heartfelt thank to all the women that let me in their homes and told me their stories, uh, you know, very emotional at times, and the, as the midwives had been generous with their time towards uh, uh, the women, the, mid the, the women were very generous with their time towards me, um, giving, giving me their all, although they all had, uh, you know, small babies and, and more important things to do than, than talk to me. Uh, so thank you so much. Those are my contacts if you want to get in touch and uh, I will link the, the full paper if anyone is interested and wants to go in and, and find out more. And I'm obviously um, here to take questions now. Thank you very much, um, Leah. A very interesting presentation, very engaging. And um, I especially like the quotes from the women. It, it felt um, like, uh, you know, very personal. You got really relational with the women and which was a good thing. They developed confidence with you. And um, indeed, I love the quotes from that, that came from the women. It makes it so real and uh, very engaging. Thank you very much. Um, there's a comment here in the public chat. Uh, the 24 seven can be uh, overwhelming for the midwives. It, it, it's great for the women to have access at any time, but does this not sometimes push uh, reasonable boundaries of a valued relationship? And then there's also another comment. Thank you, Leah, wonderful work. And uh, we have just a few minutes to take in a couple of questions. And um, yeah. yeah, the presentation did very well. So I don't know whether you'd want to respond to, to, yeah. the, uh, to the comments 
and yeah, uh, thank you Leah will you take this forward and make this a permanent feature of care in terms of scaling this yeah. what sort of um, caseload right. would be carried by by a midwife so kindly respond to those um i will uh, questions I will. and comments so, mm. sheila that's a great question so i maybe i wasn't very clear but the 24 7 was not provided by a single midwife it was provided by the 24 7 team uh backup so the midwives were never working you know here in the uk we still follow the European directive when it comes to working hours. So the midwives cannot exceed a certain number of hours per day or per week. So the, the, in the same way you would roster, you know, if you're working on a shift pattern, uh, so you would cover a shift, uh, a rotor with shifts, they were covering on calls. So yes, the, the, the women get this 24 seven access, but it's not to a single individual, it's to a team of six, to a team of six that is splitting their availability um, across the week and the months. So they can all go on holiday, they can all take study days, they, you know, obviously they can go off sick if something happens. Um, so it, it's not as overwhelming as it might sound because they're not working in an independent midwifery model. They're not on call 24 seven themselves. It's the team that is sharing uh, these, uh, uh, these, these load. So often, you know, the midwife would do seven and a half hours or 12 hours a day as she would do on a normal shift based on how uh, the RODA was organized for, for that week. Um, and the women, you know, this is um, provided within the national healthcare system. So they know they have uh, um, access to midwives, but they were, they are explained very clearly from the beginning that uh, um, the, the, the continuity is provided by a team of six and they have one in six chances of getting their midwife and that kind of doubles to one in three because they are given two midwives so they have a, a partner and a primary midwife. So yeah, I agree. The model needs to work for, for midwives as well as it has to work for women and that's why it's a team-based model rather than a um, one person doing it, doing it all. Um, I think Linda is asking if uh, this should be a permanent feature of care. So this team is still going on, they still exist. Uh, they were set up uh, as a team for the trial in a hospital that didn't have any continuity of care at all. And uh, everything was made in place so those midwives didn't get a, a a, a temporary contract, they got a permanent contract and they are they are staying on and, and working in this model. Although, obviously, I know that uh, uh, every team has been moved around and restructured because of the pandemic, uh, but it see, it's still uh, going, going strong. And as you know, uh, I'm sure you know, Linda, but there is a commitment to, to scale up those models, but obviously we need to have the right uh, uh, resources, the right number of midwives, you know, and all of those things to, to take this forward. And uh, what sort of caseload? So yeah, so in, I, I guess the caseload varies of uh, uh, based on the complexities of the women. So those women here in the trial, they had some complexities in terms of they had a higher risk of preterm birth. A lot of them were in uh, MDT, uh, care, so they were cared by a specialist clinic for pre birth as well as uh, the midwife. So the midwife carried a reduced caseload. They had, uh, um, I think, 24, uh, 24 women a month. So it was, uh, it was a, a, a small caseload. But I know it has been done in, uh, um, when I definitely did the caseload, it was uh, between 30, 30 and, and then 32 women a month. So, so it really depends on your population, where you are and, and, and everything else. So I hope that answer. Well, so we got Carol in terms of question. Oh, Joy, Joy Kemp is my yes, uh, lovely colleague yeah. at the Royal College. Um, mm -hmm. I hope, she says, how do you hope your finding will change practice? Well, I really hope that uh, because we have all the quantitative data and we know how it changes, uh, those are kind of obstetric outcomes and neonatal and, and, uh, and women outcomes and intervention. But I really hope that uh, when the, the, the Cogan Review has been taken and implemented without sometimes looking at those things that uh, 
you know, we have the numbers, but do we know what the women say about those models? And I hope, you know, my study is just one, but there are so many others that kind of say this advocacy and the relationship and the trust, but also the time and the access. So I hope that when people look at implementing a continuity model, they, they look at those core aspects and don't dilute the model. You know, it shouldn't be a tick box. Yes, you have the same midwife, but this midwife has a caseload of 50 because that's not never going to work. I hope that it will affect pra practice as in people will look at making sure those elements are in those models as, as they get implemented and scaled up. Uh, and thank you, Magda, for your thank awesome. yous. And Linda and Sonia. Yeah. Uh, mm. So she says, I was about to ask, how would you manage if there is more than one client who prefers a specific midwife based on her comfortability with a specific midwife? Yeah, so I mean, that's, uh, uh, I have to say that kind of happens sometimes uh, that uh, uh, women are, prefer one midwife, maybe because they've been cared by the person before in the past or maybe because uh, um, they are not happy with a midwife and usually you know with a team of six those teams are usually between six seven sometimes even eight midwives if they are part-time uh, it can be accommodated and, and you know people can move around it's still it's not a private service so you know if uh, if someone doesn't like seven midwives it's uh, we can't uh, uh, find uh, new ones uh, but you know within, within a team i'm sure it can be uh, accommodated and, and people can be uh, moved around but i have to say it does happen ra rarely it happens but rarely and yeah thank you leticia thank you so thank you. Thank you very much, Leah. Thank you, audience, for the many questions. And she has given her uh, contacts there. Maybe this uh, conversation can continue offline uh, after this. And Leah, once again, thank you very much for your presentation. Very enlightening. A lot of learning. It's been great. Thank you.